Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to do video two of Interview Me. I'm going to cover a few more questions about me um, and my background and my career. If you want to ask more questions, you want me to make more videos like this, um, just put your questions below, but let's dive on in. All right, so the first question here is, Hey Dimitri, I've read Quantstart website. It was mentioned that it is necessary to have a strong background in Python and C++. What is your experience? As I found you are a risk manager quant. Okay, so for risk management, I do not use C++ because I'm not on the implementation side anymore. Uh, if you worked in implementation, you would actually use Python or C++ um, to implement the models for actual use in credit risk, market risk. So credit risk, right? Uh, you're issuing loans, you need to come up with a calculation or some formula. Um, you need to determine what your decision is going to be on making a loan, pricing a loan, um, servicing loans, for example. It all comes down to timing. You would use C++ or Python. Uh, but again, no, I don't use it in my current role. Knowing C++, though, I think sets you up to actually program in any language because I believe C++, in my opinion, um, is the best language and requires the most skill to use. Once you can use C++, it's easy to learn other languages like Python, Java, Ruby on Rails, R, SAS, um, Enterprise Miner, SAS, like all kinds of different things. Easy to do once you know C++. Python specifically, yes, banks are using Python. Yes, I do use Python in my current work. Um, our bank and most large banks are going to be focused in SAS. A lot of banks are moving towards Python. Um, some banks in 2019 are actually getting rid of SAS 100% and are moving 100% to Python. So yes, you would need Python in a risk management position. It's something useful to know, useful to have, even if you're only going to be programming in SAS. Um, next question here, what was your master syllabus? Um, if you go into my LinkedIn account, see here's me, you can scroll down, I believe to, um, accomplishments and you can go to courses. I have 39 courses listed. Uh, the courses I took during my master's program were a applied macroeconomics, applied microeconomic theory, um, capital markets and investment strategies, econometric one, econometric two, financial engineering seminar, which is finance 500. It's like a boot camp, So you cover everything from C++, uh, Excel, VBA, Python, derivatives, um, doing optimization mathematical theory within C++ using like boost libraries, stuff like that. Uh, and it's everything from like Taylor series mathematics. Basically anything you would need to know to do financial engineering was taught in this class. Fixed income securities and markets, um, options, futures, and corporate decision making, quantitative economics, quantitative risk management, which is actually taught um, by a chief risk officer from a bank, one of the largest banks. Um, he retired from that position to a different position. He actually came and taught this class. Um, he'd fly in from New York City to Michigan every Friday and teach this class. And then I took uh, real estate essentials, statistical methods and finance. And I believe that's it. But a lot of my background syllabus wise is math, 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 statistics. You'll see there are some finance classes that were required for the financial engineering masters. But then I ended up going more into the econometric side and focusing more on economics and applications um, of economics and econometric time series um, to financial markets. All right, next question here is, hey man, I wanted to know your experience with learning a technical trait like financial engineering and applied economics while coming from a not so technical major like finance at Washington State. How difficult was it and what can a current accounting and finance major do to prepare if I want to apply for a financial engineering program? Okay, so this is a good question. <laughs> And surprising that you actually know my background because a lot of people that ask questions don't. Yes, I went to Washington State University and I have a finance degree. So basically I have a business degree. Um, going from business to quantitative finance was pure hell. So I can't put it any other way. If you do not have a quantitative background, it is brutal, especially if you go and do financial engineering. So applied economics is more... It was more reasonable. They expect you to take three to four classes per semester, which is the average for a graduate student here in the US. Um, financial engineering wanted us to take six courses per semester. Yes, we had some finance classes, which were a huge joke. Um, but at the end of the day, doing that, like three or four math classes, and then adding on top of that more classes for more work, it was pure hell. Uh, I was doing around 
I don't even know the hours, but when you look at how much work I put in, I was probably working between 60 and 70 hours per week with classes and homework alone. It was brutal because I did not have the background. Uh, the book I actually took, so how I got into financial engineering and all that, is I went to Washington State, I did finance, I graduated, and then I felt like I failed. Like I graduated, I did well, I had a good GPA, nobody would hire me, but I didn't have the actual mathematical skills to do things that I wanted to do. Um, I worked at a startup company, so I went and talked to like my professors, and I said, you know, I need these mathematical skills. It's great to know general finance, but I need to apply this in a very scientific way to a business. And then they told me, go get an MBA. And then I ended up taking a financial engineering class. I used this book here, which is considered Baby Hole. So it's John C. Hole's book, but it's really thin. Uh, it's like the business version. And I absolutely loved it. I took it my last semester. Um, and then I realized I was so like obsessed with it. I wanted to be a financial engineer. So I went and got the master's. Um, preparation wise, you would really need to get a book such as this book here which is a primer for the mathematics of financial engineering. Um, I'll put a link below as well. You need a lot of math. You basically need a four-year undergrad. So undergrad, you typically spend two years in generals, but you need like a two solid years of hard, heavy mathematics. Um, and then you really need like two years of computer science. And then if you have that, you could do a financial engineering program. Uh, so difficulty wise, I don't recommend it. Like if you have an accounting or finance background, I highly discourage most people from going this route because 99% of you at a real high end institution are not going to make it. Uh, but in general, how would I prepare for it? Like I said, I would go through like this primer book. Um, I would buy Stephen Shreve's two books, which, so I would buy these two books by Stephen Shreve's. They're just blue and yellow. And on top of that, I would buy this book, which is the Statistical Analysis of Financial Data in S+. There's a new version in R, so get the R version because you can actually do the hands-on work. But if you read through these books and you can kind of like grasp it and you can wrestle with the ideas for at least like six months before a financial engineering program, you, you'll survive. Like you'll make it through the program if you read these books, if you like these books, they're gonna be a huge pain. Like it's gonna be a really big struggle, but if you can do it, you can make it. Um, I have faith in you, but at the end of the day, like it's not a fun route to take. Uh, you will get crapped on by almost everybody in the program. Anyone that has a math or engineering background or computer science background will basically look down upon you. Your professors, a lot of times in these high-end math-driven financial engineering programs will actually treat you poorly. Um, so yeah, it's a rough road. Can it be done? Yes. If you read a lot of those books, I think you can catch up enough to actually make things happen um, and pass it and get through it. But I don't know if I recommend it to most people. All right. So the next question here, uh, how is your work-life balance in the risk management area compared to other quant jobs? This is a really good question. I'm going to put a link below as well to the interview I did with my buddy, Noel. Uh, he worked at UBS being a derivatives trader. Uh, you can get kind of a... I guess a comparison here. Um, my job is pretty laid back in risk management, which is why I will not leave my job. Um, it's why I've mentioned to a lot of people, I will not leave risk management. I love it. Um, I get up, right? I get ready for work. I drive in, I show up at work. When I get there, it's like around nine-ish, nine o'clock. I mean, it depends. Like if I'm late, I'm running, I don't know, even half an hour late, like you show up at 9.30, no one really cares. Um, if you leave like 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, no one really cares, right? At the end of the day, you need to put in your eight hours. We all know that. We all work our eight-hour shifts. So if you show up at 9, you can leave by 5, 5.30. Um, if you show up at like, I don't know, 9.30, then you do need to stay later to get your work done. The flexibility, though, in risk management has been amazing. The ability to work from home has been amazing. Um, the work is actually mentally stimulating. So I like to kind of like focus on you know, solving problems at work, but then you get busy and you might be working, I don't know, 50, 60 hours per week. But again, if you like the work, it doesn't really matter. Um, compared to other quant jobs, like my buddy who worked in trading, it's very scheduled. You will be there, you know, so many hours before the market's open. Then you have to be educated, reading the news on top of it. Market's open, you're actively busy the entire day. Uh, market's closed, and then you still have to do like closing work and prep work and handing the book off to the next person 
um, around the globe. The stress in these situations is really, really high. So work-life balance here I don't think is that great because A, you have to be at the office for so many hours. And when I say that, I don't mean it's like, oh, you have to work eight hours. A lot of these guys are working, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours because that's what it requires. You have to be there. You have to be researching. Uh, markets are moving. It's stressful, right? So you screw up today as a trader and you lose $250,000. You feel terrible about yourself. The stress is high. Your boss is yelling at you. Um, risk management wise, um, I mess up for the day, right? My manager comes. I look at it and say, Dimitri, you screwed up. This wasn't done right. Like, I'm sorry, right? I made a mistake. And then they give it to you and then you just redo it. So again, mistakes are not tolerated in either situation, but I think in most situations in risk management, since we're a back office job, the work-life balance is amazing. I have time to do all this YouTube channel, right? Which I do on the weekends and after work. Um, I can work from home, which is actually relaxing. I can sit back. I have like my cats at home. I can make my own breakfast. I can like, you know, take a shower at noon because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I just need to be getting stuff done and be working. So work-life balance, I think risk management is far, far better than other quant jobs. Um, compensation wise, yes, you will make less than if you were to work, uh, for example, like as a hedge fund trader or like a quantitative researcher a lot of times. But again, given that you don't have as much pressure, I, I personally prefer the work-life balance, especially as I get older, you know, I'm married, starting families, like buying houses, like settling down. Um, quant risk, I think, is far better than other areas for that aspect. If you're more concerned with money and trading and you like to live in New York City and you don't really mind like kind of jumping around or you have like a wife or a girlfriend and they don't really care, um, being a trader in a quant is awesome. It's very stimulating. But again, you do have a lot of stress and the work-life balance is not as good. Anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time. Thank you.